cool. All right, so <clears throat> what I want to cover today is two things. One, I want to show the rendering process of this, um, what looks good, obviously. Um, I want to show some advanced things that we can do to this to make it look better. Um, and then what I want to do is um, we have a motion capture um, kind of rig in the back that I want to show just how motion capture can work um, and some of the things that we can do with it. So um, this part will be pretty short because I want to give you time to actually go through and start playing with it and tweaking things and starting to render uh, and then coming back later to be actually rendered out. So the biggest thing is anytime you render stuff, um, if you remember from the intro class, when you render it in animation, it takes a long time to do. And so we want to catch any errors at the front of this, not at the back. We don't want to have to render a whole bunch of stuff out and then realize, whoops, I forgot to turn this off or that off or whatever. Um, so let me get my bearings. There's my camera. OK. So if you don't remember from last time, too, make sure that your um, on your D drive, there is a Maya folder. Make sure you delete that Maya folder, and the next time you drag the new Maya folder or your Maya folder into that every time you come in. And then also make sure that you go to File, Set Project. You tell Maya which project you're working on, and then you go and open your file like that, OK? Because you want to make sure that Maya knows what project you're working on and obviously which file. When we render, it's going to be put into your folder, not somebody else's folder, hopefully. OK, so let's go to our render cam here. And one of the things that really makes your animations look good is having some sort of motion blur on your stuff. So inside of After Effects, if you ever took that class, one of the big things that was pretty much you know, like it could take a bad animation and make it better, not good, but better, is um, it having that motion blur on there. Because if you had a little mistake, it would kind of cover it up a bit. So inside here, I'm going to go to my render settings. And under this little gear right there, I may have said that before, but this little gear with the clappers, the render settings, there's a common tab. There's an Arnold renderer. And under here is motion blur. So if I turn on motion blur, I go to a spot that looks like there's a lot of movement, like right let's say there, and I hit the render button, I'll be able to preview what the motion blur is doing. Very subtle in that frame. Let me go to this render. So you see how I'm clicking this and nothing's popping up, right? So at home when I work, I have three monitors. I have one over here and I have one over here. That render view is one on one of these other monitors. I don't know which one. So I need to save my Maya and close it. And this will happen to you, I'm sure, because it happens to everyone. Inside my Maya um, 2018 folder, inside prefs, there's one called window preferences. And this is like the actual, like it stores the data for where you put each window. And it's cool because what happens is when you open up Maya every time, it remembers where you put windows. When you go from three screens to one screen, that doesn't help you. So you could edit it if you wanted to, like actually just open this up inside of uh, WordPad or Notepad. And there's the actual like X, Y, Z positions or X and Y. Or you can just hit the delete key and then when you reopen Maya, it will just regenerate that and kind of reset all your windows. OK, um, especially here, even with two monitors, you may go home and your other monitor is on the other side. It does the same thing. OK, it'll drive you crazy because you click it 5,000 times and it just never wants to show up. Um, just while we're waiting, this is what we're doing in the modeling class. It's a Negan bat. Is that awesome? Let's close that. And we'll also close this. That's why I need so many monitors. I have so many windows open. I don't think you need anything with Photoshop. All right. 
right, so now all my windows are basically reset to where they were before. I'm going to set my project again. Now, because I just closed my, it's still set to the same spot, but because I'm paranoid, I always go to set project because I want to make sure it's set to what I'm working on. So I'm working on mech animation, I hit set. <laughs> I'm in a loop. <laughs> Get me out. Let's try that again. I mean, Maya is still thinking because this is still chugging along. There we go. All right, mech animation done. Oh my God. <laughs> there we go. I think that worked. That's what I get for being responsible and actually like setting my preferences project. All right, let's try this again. All right, Arnold, Arnold render view. Where are you at, Arnold? That one comes up. There it is. Uh, another hotkey window and then the arrow keys. It, I tried that last time, it should have worked. But this will actually like move your window around. So, cool. All right, so now back to what we were originally discussing, which was motion blur. We wanna go to a spot where we see a lot of movement. So let's say even right here. And I'm gonna preview this. And there's the motion blur on there. So, <clears throat> So you can see how uh, big that blur is on top of that. So if I go to my render settings, I go back to my Arnold renderer, I go back to my motion blur. Um, I can add more keys inside here. And what this is going to do is it's gonna make like the in-between frames and help blur or help blend this out. So in this case, we're not gonna notice a huge difference. It's pretty much you know the same thing from one to the other. If we had a ball going up like this, that's where we would really see it, like on, a, on an arc. Um, now there's also a position. So right now it's uh, blurring the center of the frame as my main frame, and it's going basically back a half a frame and forward a half a frame, and that's how it's creating the blur, okay? So imagine that I'm throwing something really far across the room. I basically want the solid object to be at the front of it and the blur to be behind it. The way it's set up now is the blur is in the middle, so my object is right here, and the blur goes like this. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna set this to the end of the frame. And again, you may not notice a huge difference in this case, but just for future stuff, that's typically where you'd want that to be. Um, there's also some other things here like deformation and camera. So sometimes you may not want your camera to actually be motion blurred. And what that means is as your camera is like spinning around, you may want that to be crystal clear, but the objects are still blurry. Okay, so I may want, let's say, uh, I deleted our crazy camera that we had from last time. Let me make a new crazy camera. For whatever reason, I'm going crazy and I'm just gonna set a keyframe here at 50 and then I'll set another keyframe here at 60 where I'm like really zoomed in on this. Sweet. And then I'm gonna choose my dip other camera view here which is my perspective And so right now we're getting the um, camera's motion blur and we're getting the object's motion blur. If I go halfway in between this, are we really gonna see a difference? Eh, it's subtle. There's a subtle difference here. We're getting a little bit of a zoom. If I turn this camera one off, the object should be the only thing that's kind of blurring, not the rest of the environment. So what this could cause is, let's say that I had a bunch of trees in my scene. As I'm sweeping across all those trees, all those trees would be super blurry even though they're not moving. The camera is what's moving, okay? So at some points, you may want to turn the camera off. Uh, under deformation, um, that is how an object is deforming. So if I go here, okay, so let's pretend I have a sphere. If I'm moving this like this, or like this, or like that, 
those are called transformations. So that's not actually deforming the object, those are transformational movements. So the way that the castle is animated is part transformational, part deformational. Okay, so these here, this is a deformation one. Um, anything that is scaling or even rotating, these are all transformational. The deformation part comes in if I were to grab points and animated these points like this, that would be something that would anim be um, deform motion blur, okay? So nothing we need to be concerned about with that. Typically, leaving this on for this assignment is going to be fine. Oops, I closed my window, didn't I? Yes, I did. Um, the reason we may want to turn this one off is because we may want to speed things up. Again, in this case, there's not a huge difference between the two, so I would just leave it just like it is, okay? Uh, so typically, my settings that I leave on here for this one, that's like way too much camera blur. You can definitely tell in this specific shot. I'm like zooming into that thing. That looks weird. So I've turned the camera blur off. I'd leave the other two, obviously, enable on and deformation on. Two keys is typically enough for what we're doing here. When we get into the bouncing ball or the stick, we may need to up that to three or four. And I set this to end of frame. And then the more this length is, the more blur we're going to have on that, okay? So typically 0.5 is a good enough value. I'm happy with that. Now we may get some glitching that happens inside here, especially, let me go back to my other camera. Uh, not this one, that one. Panels, perspective, render cam, there we go. Right here, see how this thing just kind of like comes into existence, like right there? So if I go right before, for this at 1.30, and I make sure I choose the render cam. Sometimes we'll get like a weird ghosting image right there. I'm gonna go up a frame, that one's good. Go up a frame, that one's good, okay. So in this case, I'm not getting it. Most likely you will get something, somebody in here will get some weird glitchy thing where literally your tower or something will disappear. It happens every semester, so if it does, we'll worry about it then. Basically, what we have to do is find the frame. So let's say it's frame 70. We go to frame 70, we let it render, and then we just save this image and overwrite the bad frame, okay? It's not a huge deal. We just have to do that. If it's a lot of frames, then we'll worry about other stuff. <clears throat> All right. So, um, cool. So this is uh, one of the things that I always want to focus on is making sure that Everything that we're doing here is um, supporting the animation and it's not detracting from it. So I'm going to go to one of these things and they keep moving this around. Paint effects, where'd you move to? Workspaces, no, general, model. There it is, modeling, paint effects. I didn't want that though. I want the visor. General editors, content browser, that's what I want. All right, so inside of window, general editors, content browser, they keep renaming this thing and moving it around. Um, here's a whole bunch of stuff that is free inside here. This is an animation class, so you're not required to actually model anything specifically for this class, with the exception of the bouncy ball, which is just a sphere, okay? So if there's something that you're like, hey, I think something may add a nice touch to this scene um, and not detract from what my animation is, then feel free to add it in there. But just keep in mind, let's say I add this That's the best one. Let's say I add this bolt to mine. You just drag it in. <laughs> it's huge. And then I scale it down. Oh, you're still too big. There we go. Okay. So that's perfectly fine for me to add something like this to my scene. Now, what I wouldn't want to do is drop in every single one of these or create colors that are so contrasty or so obviously different from everything else that my attention is drawn away from the animation and drawn onto these guys, okay? Now there's other stuff inside here too. There's bipeds, there's clothing, not that you'd need clothing for you know this kind of thing. Here's some props, you can drop in a tree. And again, everything is gonna come in huge just because of the scale. tree would probably be, you know, let's say a bigger tree like that. Maybe there's a tree stump. 
If I put a trash can there, that would be like really obvious. Like, why is there a trash can in this castle? That doesn't make sense. There's a tree stump. Right. Okay. So all of these kind of lend to the atmosphere of what I'm trying to show off. They don't detract from the rest of the scene. They're just nice little pieces here. Oops. That would. <laughs> Get out of the way. What are you doing? Um, oops. Am I stairs or on which side? That side. Okay, yep. So that tree back there is good. The cow is good. Where did my tree stump go? Right there in the way. Okay. So all of these things could add a nice little touch to my scene. But again, too much stuff, a vehicle or a jet ski or whatever, weapons, you know, some of those could be cool. The uh, sculpting stamps I don't need. Um, there's also under F, nope, paint effects, there it is. Under here, there are plants. And right there's plants. So these ones here, these ones are not bad because they're actually pretty nicely modeled and they're pretty simple. They don't detract from things. If I go to, let's say, a tree mesh, and I drag this tree in here. Oops. I have to click on it and then draw. That's how that one works. There we go. So this one definitely looks like a better tree. But what you're going to find when I render this is that that looks pretty horrible. Or non-existent. Make sure I pick the right camera, perspective. Yep. So this is PaintFX. PaintFX doesn't render in Arnold. Every renderer is different. So if I convert this from a um, paint effects to polygon somewhere in here, right there, convert, there it is, OK? Now that looks like a pretty you know, decent looking tree. If I zoom in closer, you'll see that the leaves are actually like really gray. Yes, you can see kind of like that plane there. And that there, these are just pictures of leaves on this, and that's why that looks like that. Now, there's going to be a huge difference or a huge takeaway if all of my stuff in the scene is like that. Like, if I duplicate this tree seven trillion times, that would take away from my animation. If you look at uh, Wade, Wade has a nice assortment of trees back there um, on his that really help the scene just kind of become more of a scene, as opposed to this, which is nice with one, but I couldn't take this tree and do that with it because it would really detract from what I'm trying to show off. Okay, so don't compete with what you're trying to show, thinking that you can compensate. If your animation isn't bad, fix the. An or if your animation is bad, fix the animation. Don't worry about adding a bunch of stuff trying to cover it up. Now, just for fun, um, this is a tool inside Maya called Mash. It's very similar to um, the motion. Uh, MoGraph inside of Cinema. If I click an item, so like this cow here, and I click on the MoGraph or the Mash, it will take my cow and it will duplicate my cow. Okay. And then I can go into my Mash and I can say I want to. Where is that one at? Use Paint Effects, I believe. Nope, not paint effects. I want to go to mash, placer, that's what I want. So I'm going to add a placer node. And what this allows me to do is just say add. And I can just literally like click and drag. And there's cows, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then you can go down here to randomness. There we go, random scale, 0 0.5. All right, let's go 0 0.2, 0 0.2, perfect. Oh, no, sorry. That's not random. 0.2 to, let's say, 2. That would be random. There we go. So now I get different sizes. I can do a random rotation, like 180 degrees. So now I'm, like, randomly rotating them. So I'm, like, overkilling my scene with all these cows. Um, no one's going to pay attention to my animation at all. Okay? <laughs> and if I want to delete them, I just click mash and hit delete, and they all go away. Okay, so the point of that one is just make sure that whatever you add to your scene is stuff that's going to help your animation or help kind of make it a better piece versus something that's going to pull away from that animation itself. All right, so then the next thing I want to show is under my render cam. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to go back to my render settings. <clears throat> I'm going to turn motion blur off for a second. Uh, that's good there. OK, good. Uh, I'm going to go under environment. I'm going to go to atmosphere. Every single time, I don't remember. I think it's fog is the right one. Once I click on this, I'll know. Once it lets me click on it, then I'll know. So what this can do is this can help create a nice atmosphere. Right now, we just have lighting in the scene, so the light comes from nowhere and hits our objects, and they get lit up. The fog or atmosphere will actually give like this like cloudy look to it, uh, where it feels like the light is actually there. So if you were outside last night around 8 or 9 o'clock, there was a nice little fog um, around. Come on. That's what we're trying to do. Yep, this one should be it. So we'll find out for sure. All right, so I go to the fog, I click the arrow, hit Control A. There we go. And now I can control the fog. So we'll find out if this is the correct one, is one might not be the correct one. No, nope, that's it. So now you can see how it feels like we have more of an atmosphere here. It feels a little bit washed out, but still we have an atmosphere. Uh, we can control the distance. I should turn my Arnold renderer on. That's too much of a distance. Let's go down, down, down. There it is. Right? So what this is doing is basically from where we're at, the closer we get to the object, the more we're going to be able to see the object. So as I pull in like this, make sure I'm in the right camera. Render cam. All right, so here's me further back. You can see the fog is basically like too much. As I get closer, I can see that item. Uh, 0 0.05, that's good. I'm going to pull the, disc, the height up a bit. Okay, so that's one kind of fog where it's kind of a little more interactive with our scene. Um, the other one, break that, which is the atmosphere volume. This one turns out nothing, so you don't see anything here. And then I can crank up the density. And this one is really neat because you can do other stuff with it, like you can give it more of a color than the other one. There's this attenuation, so we can add some drop off to it. And then I believe. No, nope, that was it. Yep. So again, something kind of cool that you could add to it. Again, something you don't want to detract. Um, 0 0.005, oops, right? So something subtle like this can add a lot of kind of depth to your scene versus just having nothing in there. So look at the view there versus there. So it actually feels like there's some sort of environment that we're in, even if it's just a subtle little touch or a hue adjustment or a color adjustment on top of it. Okay, so that's another thing we can do. Um, I'm going to break that connection. And then that's my crazy camera. I'm going to delete that. And then the other thing we can do is we can add some depth of field to this. So I'm going to render this through that camera. Actually, let me run it through perspective just so we can see a better sense of depth of field. It's not playing nice. Update. There it goes. So. Arnold does not play nice sometimes. You saw the things that not come out. OK. All right, so there's my view. Now, what I want to do is, right now, this is perfectly clear from this side to that side. If this was a huge scene, it wouldn't be. There would be some sort of softening happening either over here or over there, depending on what I'm focusing on, OK? If this was like a real video camera in medieval times. So if I click on that camera that I'm using, which is my perspective, there we go. 
and then I go into the attribute editor for it, in all of these there's an Arnold section. Okay, so these are all the different attributes that we can play with to adjust what this thing looks like. One of them way at the bottom is Arnold. And in here, very similar to what we could play with inside of Cinema, you can control what kind of camera it is. So perspective is what we typically deal with. I'm going to enable depth of field. And it may not update. Let's see. Let's close this and reopen it. Again, sometimes you just have to do that in order to get it to update. OK, it's good. And then I'm going to set the distance. So right now my distance is set to 5. I want to see how far from my camera this step is. Okay, So if I go to Display, Heads Up Display, Object Details, I can click on an object, and it'll say that that item is 17 units from the camera, 17.389. So if I go back to the perspective view, I click on this focus distance. I set that number. Then I can start to crank up the aperture size. And then what you'll see is I'll start to get that fuzziness. Okay, So where I have certain items in focus and other items not in focus, um, you can see this goes crazy big, and this really is like this is locked into clear, and then it's super fuzzy and even super fuzzier. So again, you don't want to take away from the animation, but we just want to add, we can add some stuff to make it look um, much more realistic or much more appealing. Okay, now this is on perspective. This is not on my regular camera. Let me turn it off just so you can see. You saw what that looked like. I'm going to go back to my regular camera. <clears throat> switch to my render cam, enable depth of field, and I don't know how far the items are because I'm in a different camera. So I'm going to click on this. Oh no. 8.026. Right there. So I'm going to go back to that render cam, go back to this. Okay. And what we'll see in this case is that there's not a whole lot. There's a little bit. It's very subtle right around here. There's a little bit of fuzz uh, happening on there. Uh, point, uh, let's just set it to one. There you go. If I really crank it up, this will become, again, crystal clear, and then it'll be fuzzier around the edges. Okay. Now here's where this is going to be tricky, because if I use something like this, What do you think is going to happen if I do that? Oops, not that. Do you think it'll look still like this is crystal clear and the rest is fuzzy? Or is the whole thing fuzzy? Right? Because my distance from the camera has now changed to what is in focus. So if I do something like this on an animated camera, I need to animate that feature as well. So I would need to go into there. That's 13, and then I'll go up to, let's say, here, and that's 9. And so I would just go back to the very beginning of this. Thirteen away, set a key, go up to the very front of that, nine, set a key. And then of course you want to check it out because if I screwed up and you know I, my camera moves faster than that's updating, then that could be an issue. Yeah, like right there, that looks a little bit too fuzzy for my liking. So maybe this should be 10 or 8. Nope. Let's click on a piece and see. 9.988. So picky. Okay, now remember I can also take the aperture size down too. So at some point I may want to keyframe this going to 0.5. All right? Right? So there's motion blur we can add to our stuff. There's the volume fogs we can add to our stuff. 
There is um, depth of field we can add to our stuff. All of these will, again, lend more likability to this thing. When you look at something from Pixar or from ILM or any of those, they're using all of these plus like 100 things more to make their stuff look as good as it does. Okay? There's no shortcut to it. That's just, it is what it is. Um, for this one, I don't care about the um, depth of field. It's something I wanted to show, so you could add it if you wanted to. You don't have to add that. Um, you don't have to add the fog in your scene. Again, it looks nice, uh, but I do want you to add the motion blur to your scene. Okay, so make sure you've clicked on that motion blur. Under the common tab, um, did we set these up before on yours? Last class? You don't think so? Okay. Um, I was verifying because I mine's partly set up, but I don't know if I rendered it for something else. Okay. So um, right now you can go to your render settings and you can do this at any point inside your file. <clears throat> so click on the little gear with the clapper or the clapper with the gear. And we want to rename this. So we're going to go to where it says file name prefix and you're going to put in your last name underscore. Um, you can do Game of Thrones, you can do Mechamation, whatever you want to call it. As long as you know what it's called, that's the key thing there. That way, in case we end up losing this, we can always jump back and get it. Um, notice at the top here where it says path, this is where your files are going to go. So if your file says somebody else's folder, that means you haven't set your project. So always make sure that you check that as well. Uh, we're going to go save these as EXRs. <clears throat> That's fine there. Under frame slash animation extension, this should be set to the third one down, name.pound.extension. Okay, so not the single frame, not the single frame, this third one, that's what it should be set to. And then your start frame is one. What's our end frame? 240, right? And then we'll choose which camera we're rendering through. So I have my render camera set up, so I'm gonna choose render cam. If you haven't set up your camera yet, just remember where this is so you can come back in here and reset up your camera. Um, all of our stuff we render is 960 by 540. So make sure we have 960 by 540 set here. And this is, um, it's called the comment tab for a reason because regardless of which renderer we're using, um, that tab stays the same. Okay, even if you go into cinema or you go into um, any other 3D software, you'll see a tab very similar to this, which is basically where do you want your files, what do you want them called, and how do you want them named and numbered, okay? So that's what that tab is. The next tab, the Arnold renderer one, you just have to come down to the motion blur area and check enabled and turn the camera off and set that to end of frame. So scroll down to where it says motion blur, enabled on, camera off, end of frame. And those settings we'll use throughout all of our projects. You'll see, when, especially when we do like the stick or the bouncing ball, how much animation we really get from the motion blur. It really does help um, make it look better. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right, now the only other thing you may need to tweak is the settings at the very top of this. So right now my camera AA, which is my anti-aliasing, is set to three. If I crank this down to something like negative three, that's as good as this is ever gonna look, okay? So at negative two, it looks like this. At negative one, it looks like that. At zero, it looks like this. So we're getting cleaner. And then it was at three, like that, so that's looking pretty good. Oops. These shadows are still a little bit noisy. I may want to pull that up one more to four. That should help the shadows a bit and help this uh, motion blur some, that looks better. Okay, so that's good there. Um, if I saw that some of my other stuff was needing some adjustments, I could adjust these as well. So if my reflections were uh, too fuzzy or my materials, my colors were too fuzzy, 
I could up those as well, and that would help that. The more you up these, because you may just think, well, I'm just going to crank this up. The more you crank that up, the longer this rendering is going to take. So if I go to, let's say, negative 3, this takes 0 seconds. If I go to positive 4, <clears throat> right there where it says rendering, it'll say however long it's going to take. Sixteen seconds. Okay, so that's sixteen seconds for one frame. So who? How long is it going to take if one frame takes sixteen seconds? How long will the whole thing take? Forever. Forever. <laughs> sixteen seconds times two hundred and forty frames. That many seconds. Which, if we calculate that into minutes, sixty-four minutes. Which we calculate that into hours. 1.06666 repeating hours, okay? So roughly it'll take an hour and a little bit. The more detail that's in the scene, the longer it's gonna take. So if we figure this is kind of like the middle of this where we have a lot of our geometry there, that's a good estimate. If I was doing everything way back here at frame zero or one, this shouldn't take 16 seconds to render because there's nothing there. So that'd be a bad frame to estimate, yeah, seven seconds, okay? And if I went to the very end and estimated, well, there's a lot of frames that don't really have anything in them. So again, it's a bad way to kind of estimate how, many, how long this is going to take. <clears throat> so we went from 7 seconds to 16 seconds. Let's see how long this one would take to render. It's 21 seconds, OK? So it's good to always have like that middle frame where you're like, OK, I have like half my geometry in the scene. Let's see how long this takes. Cool. Um, so we can close that window. And then under your rendering menu, so if you click this and go down to rendering, or you can hold the space bar and go to render. Either way, we need to get to this render menu. So render here or render here. You're going to go to render sequence and go to the option box. And this is how we get stuff out of Maya. So we've set up our render settings. We've set up the um, materials. We've set up the lights. We've set up the camera. Everything's cool. So here we choose which camera we want, we want to render, which is the render cam. And then we just say render sequence and close. Now what this is going to do is it's going to go through frame by frame, and it's going to render out each one of my frames for this um, specific scene. So if you remember how Cinema was doing it, um, one of the ways we could do it is through the Picture Viewer, and this is very similar to the Picture Viewer. It renders it, saves it, renders it, saves it. Um, I'm going to hit Escape for a second, and that's how you stop it. If we go to Render, and I use this Batch Render, okay, you may see a tutorial online, and someone may say go to Batch Render to render your stuff. If I do this, because Arnold is a, um, a pay software, you get watermarks that say Arnold all over it, okay? So you don't want that. So the workaround is that you use render sequence, and it renders inside the viewport. It takes longer, but at least you don't have watermark. Okay, so once you have your stuff anim um, animated, you have the lighting good, you have some textures good, you have your camera in there, you've turned on your motion blur, which we just did, then you can do this stage, which is rendering it out. And then once it renders out, our last step is just to go into After Effects and actually make it into a movie. And this process is exactly the same that you saw in the intro class. Import it in as a sequence, make it a movie, and you're done. Okay? I'll show it just as a refresher. So Maya's been chugging along this whole time, too. Um, I'm on frame 155 of 234, or 240. So I'm just going to use what I've got out. So in After Effects, we double click in this area. Boom, boom. We go and find our stuff. Oh, there we go. I'll just use that. 
Uh, we want to make sure this is 30 frames a second. So up here, I make sure it's 30 frames a second. I drag this into my new comp. And there's our scene. That's what we showed last time. And then we just add this to the render queue. Click lossless. Click QuickTime. H.264. You can add audio, too, if you wanted to. Make sure you save it into the correct folder. So this is going to go into my 2540, Mac Animation, Movies, Sarcona, again, whatever you want to call it, Mac Animation, Game of Thrones, as long as it's obvious and then render it out, okay? And then when you turn in your stuff on the Z drive, there it is, on the Z drive, there's a 2540 folder, and then there will be a Mechamation turn in, or Game of Thrones turn in, whatever you wanna call it. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. Uh, if you don't remember from last semester or the semester before, whenever you took the intro, once you drop something in there, you can't remove it, you can't rename it, you can't delete it. Just leave it in there and I will take care of it. Just tell me. Um, for the Game of Thrones one, we set keyframes, we manipulated timing of the keyframes, we did basic materials, we rendered an Arnold, and we compiled a sequence. You're turning in everything, so your entire project folder will go into this folder, okay? Your movie, um, eight seconds, however long it, um, it turned out. Mine turned out to be eight seconds, 240 frames. Oh, I canceled it. Um, sweet. So you'll also turn this in. This is due next class. So make sure you have it by the end of next class, you have that one ready to go. We'll be starting on the next assignment next class, so my recommendation is before you leave today, have that other one ready to render. That way it's good. So when you come in next time, maybe it's done, maybe it's not, maybe you just need to render out a couple frames. If this crashes or stops, like mine stopped, I would figure out what frame it stopped at, 147. I'd go to my render settings, or 150, you know, what did it stop at? Let me go into my folder and find out where it actually stopped. So P drive there, 40, Mac, what is this? 162 it stopped at. Okay, so I go here, I would say start at frame 162, and then go back to render sequence, and then it would just pick right up where it left off. And then once it's done, then um, I would turn in that whole folder. Now just to see, let me um, see if this is, there's any issues with this one yet? Nope, perfect. I knew it. Cool. Okay, so by the end of next class, make sure you turn in your Game of Thrones. Also turn in this submission form. That way I know that you've turned your stuff in, yours is ready to go, and everything's cool. Awesome, any questions on that? Nope.